Good morning, uh, Mr. Secretary. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Subcommittee on Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education. And we're genuinely looking forward to your testimony. Delighted to have you here and uh, delighted that you're in place over at the uh, Office of uh, Health and Human Services. Mr. Secretary, your responsibilities are many. Your department's responsible for ensuring proper payments for Medicare and Medicaid dollars, for overseeing biomedical research that can save millions of lives, for helping families break the cycle of poverty, and for protecting our nation against bioterror and pandemic events. I'll ask you some questions this morning about whether this budget uh, leaves America sufficiently prepared to respond to a pandemic, a new disease like Zika, or a bioterrorism event. And I'll ask you some questions how you'll fulfill your mission of enhancing the health and well-being of Americans uh, at your proposed level of funding. Uh, I'll ask uh, how you will work to solve some of the challenges in your agencies, including those related to the Indian Health Services and the opioid epidemic. And as a reminder to the subcommittee and our witness, uh, we will abide by the five-minute rule so that everybody will have a chance uh, to get their questions asked and answered. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to yield the floor to our, our ranking member, my very good friend, uh, the uh, gentle lady from uh, uh, Connecticut. Thank and you very, uh, very then much. we'll move on, obviously, to the chairman and the ranking member of the full committee. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman. And it's good to be with the the sugar. I need the caffeine. Yeah, I need the. Sweet. I need the. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and our uh, chairman, ranking member of the full committee, and welcome, um, Mr. Secretary. Um, uh, this is, I guess, your first appropriations hearing, so we're delighted to have you here this morning. There are some real bright spots in this proposal. Let me highlight them right off the bat. First and foremost, I am heartened by your commitment to confronting the opioid epidemic. In my home state of Connecticut, the state medical examiner's office has reported that opioid deaths have tripled over just six years, from 357 in 2012 to 1,038 in 2017. The federal government has a critical role to play in supporting state and local communities as they work to combat the tragic consequences of addiction. In the spirit of the two-year budget agreement we passed in February, Congress committed to allocating $6 billion for opioids. The Department's 2019 budget builds on that commitment by requesting an additional $10 billion. Your budget includes uh, uh, some promising proposals on mental health and assertive community treatment uh, that I believe move us in the right direction. It's glad to know that you signed an extension of the public health emergency declaration for Puerto Rico uh, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And I was pleased to hear you say on February 15th that the Dickey Amendment does not prevent gun violence research within the agency. Uh, we cannot let another year go by without funding uh, to do this research. Uh, since Congress ended support for gun violence research, more than 600,000 people have been shot. Uh, and I think we can all agree that enough is enough. In your testimony, you say you want to implement change and reform the programs that, and I quote, are not as effective as they can be or cost, or cost more than they ought to be or fail to deliver on their promise. And yet, in the same proposal, you completely eliminate the LIHE program, uh, which fits into the Administration for Children and Family Strategic Goal to build healthy and safe environments. For 2014, approximately a third of LIHEAP heating were elderly households, and 19 percent were households with young children. And I have heard from so many constituents who depend on LIHEAP. They rely on the program to keep their children healthy, to keep their families safe. So I have a hard time seeing how keeping children warm is, quote, failing to deliver on a promise. Your budget eliminates the Community Services Block Grant which is certainly effective, given that it connects 16 million people in 99 percent of counties across this country with job training, nutrition programs, LIHEAP, and more. It eliminates preschool development grants, which meets its stated goal of expanding access to high-quality preschool for low- and middle-income families. In fact, it has led to 28,000 more children being served, and over the four years of the grants, approximately 150,000 additional children will attend high-quality preschool programs. The proposal makes cuts to impactful programs as well. $729 million for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, $1 billion from HRSA, Workforce Training, $68 million from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or ARC. And I'm curious 
how eliminating programs that hardworking Americans depend on is keeping with the mission of your agency. On first glance, the $10 billion requested for the opioid epidemic sounds impressive. It's clearly needed. So I was surprised to see that in a budget that pr prioritizes opioid funding, which we need, you also endorse an even more draconian version of Graham Cassidy, which cuts Medicaid by at least $175 billion and would cause 32 million people to lose their health insurance. The ACA and Medicaid expansion have helped so many Americans who suffer from mental health and substance abuse disorders. So why are we looking to take away that care? The proposal for Medicaid uh, uh, includes cuts. It includes lifetime limits, work requirements. Just on Monday, I held an opioid roundtable in my district with healthcare professionals, state and local officials, and yes, addicts. Um, I heard from people on the ground that the biggest problem is that there are not enough providers for Medicaid recipients, uh, that there's insufficient reimbursement to providers. So my concern is, is the, what the result of the pro your proposal may be. More Americans, and particularly our most vulnerable, disabled children rely on Medicaid, disabled adults, seniors, individuals, children, families who would go without care, the health care coverage and access to the care that they need. The budget proposes to cut the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration by $219 million. On one hand, the department requests funding for opioids, which is great. On the other hand, the department slashes access to substance abuse treatment and cuts millions from SAMHSA. Again, I don't understand the logic. An area that appears to be good news is an increase for child care. It's proposed along with cuts to programs on the mandatory side um, that low and middle income uh, uh, families rely on. Uh, uh, this scheme would cut temporary assistance for needy families, eliminate the social services block grant, programs that support child care, erasing the impact of the proposed additional discretionary funds. We have one in six children who are eligible for child care assistance receiving just that number receiving any help. So we need to be doing more. We've got cuts uh, to the funding that CDC gives uh, to the states uh, for public health uh, departments. It reduces surveillance, epidemiology, laboratory testing, as well as immunizations uh, and emergency preparedness, preparedness activities in our states. The proposal decimates health the health care workforce programs. Research shows us that we are facing a shortage of more than 100,000 doctors by 2030. On the funding for the NIH, for 2018, we have worked hard to increase funds, and yet the proposal for 2019 seems to reverse that direction. Uh, and we know that a breakthrough at NIH saves not just one life, but potentially millions of lives. Uh, so. Uh, in the proposal, you propose to shift $4.4 billion in mandatory funding in HRSA to the discretionary side of the budget. That's $3.6 billion uh, for community health centers. As you know, the Congress just reauthorized this mandatory funding for fiscal years 2018-2019, adding additional money in both years. So I, I, I think you have to agree with us that this new proposal, it, it has to be a non-starter. If we were to make this shift, we would need to add more funding as well, because there's no amount of magical accounting that's going to fund the programs you are cutting uh, when you, you, you cut their funding source. It is a little bit like playing three-card Monty with funding for life-saving programs. Um, I also, I mean, I'm going to uh, uh, really end up with this. I need to hear from you on what is, in my view, a very grave matter, and that is the issue of, of uh, a personnel matter for you, and that is Scott Lloyd. I will be frank with you, as I was when we met. I believe he should be fired immediately. Uh, it should have happened months ago. I'm going to be asking questions about that when we get to the Q&A. Who is Scott Lloyd? He's the director of the Office of Refugee Resettlement within HHS. He is a lawyer. He's not a medical professional. My view, he has overstepped his position of authority, violated young immigrant women's privacy, their right uh, 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 to medical uh, care, 
in some cases, their safety to keep them from accessing safe and legal abortions. Um, he has overstepped his authority. This is not what his job is about. Finally, the barrage of attacks on Title X, a program that provides affordable birth control, reproductive health care, will only hurt women. HHS's repeated actions to reduce access to contraception will lead to an increase in unplanned pregnancies and lead to more abortions. In order to achieve fewer abortions in this country, we need to support access to affordable contraception and family planning. It is the obligation of this subcommittee to ensure that working men and women in this country are not harmed by reckless cuts or a disregard for their well-being. Mr. Secretary, as I said, there are some very good things in this proposal, but there are some very bad things, in my view, in this proposal. I look forward to finding out whether you support these cuts. I certainly hope not. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Uh, before we uh, proceed, I just want to advise the committee and the audience, we're having, obviously, problems with our sound system here, so I want you all to be aware of that, and you might want to speak a little bit louder for the benefit of the Secretary. We're not yelling at you. We just want you to hear us, Mr. Secretary. Uh, that We're very honored today to have uh, the chairman of the full committee and our ranking member here as well, so I'll recognize uh, them uh, for whatever opening remarks they uh, care to make. So, Mr. Chairman. Well, th thank you, Chair you, Chairman Cole, and for the time, I also want to welcome uh, Secretary Lazar to the Appropriations Committee. We look forward to your testimony and hearing your frank and candid views on a wide variety of uh, subjects. As I say at every meeting, the power of the purse lies in this building. It is the constitutional duty of Congress to make spending decisions on behalf of the people we represent at home. With that uh, in mind, uh, this committee, ably led by Mr. Cole and Ms. DeLauro, uh, did pass, it seems like 100 years ago, the uh, fiscal year 2018 Labor, Health, and uh, Human Services Appropriations Bills. I just want to assure everyone that Ms. Lowy and I are working very hard 24-7 uh, with our Senate colleagues to finish the fiscal year 18 <laughs> appropriations process and send the bill to the President for his signature. We intend to uh, adequately uh, uh, fund important programs, including yours, and with a remarkable increase in new domestic spending uh, agreed upon in the CAP agreement for fiscal year uh, 18 and 19. While much of it is targeted, we are counting on you to make sure that it is well spent and, and not wasted. Let me say, I, I, I do think, and, and there's certainly a reason for it, a lot of what we're doing here is opioid-centric. But I, I, I share with, uh, I think, members of the panel on a bipartisan basis some concerns about some of the reductions. I think all of us are big supporters of the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Collins and his crew there do a remarkable job, and, and uh, I think we involve our constituents often in some of those uh, clinical trials, and, and uh, we salute the work they do, and I know the chairman and the ranking member are very supportive of, of uh, their mission. Uh, I also have concerns and uh, have always been a strong supporter of the Centers for Disease Control. I am concerned about the health workforce programs to train uh, nurses and physicians. This is a huge investment, important investment, has historically been very important to our nation. And I, I've, I've always supported, maybe having been a county official over 35 years ago, the, the important role of community service block grants. And, and coming from a state where the temperature this morning was below freezing, we have a lot of constituents who are concerned about the uh, future of, uh, of LIHEAP. We know you have a tough job, uh, but you have a good committee here. Uh, the last time I stepped in here, the discussion was rather heated, uh, and, and perhaps when I leave, that that will, that will be the case. But it, it's it's not because, uh, you know, th there aren't great people here. The people are very passionate on both sides, uh, on on many of these issues, and we're, we're, we're have confidence in the work that uh, and mission that you have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now welcome uh, our ranking member of the full committee back to her favorite subcommittee. Uh, and uh, it's always a delight to have my uh, good friend, the gentlelady from New York here. Gentlelady's recognized. Well, thank you. And I'd like to thank Chairman Cole for your leadership on this committee, Chairman Freelinghuis and Ranking Member DeLauro for holding this hearing. 
and Secretary, Mr. Secretary, it's a pleasure to have you here today. I enjoyed our first conversation, and I do hope we can continue the dialogue. And I do welcome you before this subcommittee. You come before us with a budget that would cut your department's discretionary funding by, by 11 percent, weakening our ability to improve public health and confront emerging epidemics. But as I talk about this budget, Mr. Secretary, I'd rather call it the Mulvaney budget, since I know you're just assuming these responsibilities, and I hope that we can work together to improve this budget because after looking at your record, your outstanding scholarship, your outstanding leadership, I know that we would probably agree on some of the changes that this committee and this Congress would make. Because your budget would eliminate heating assistance for low-income Americans, and in particular, seniors. Gut investments in the health workforce at a time when we face a nursing and primary care shortage. And for reasons that, frankly, I cannot fathom, eliminate teen pregnancy prevention grants, which since 2010 helped more than one million young Americans make informed decisions about their sexual health. These grants, when distributed to evidence-based programs, reduce unintended pregnancy and give more young people a shot at their dreams. Trying to eliminate them is just one of the ways this administration is harming women's health. Of course, we've seen this administration attack on women's care, health care in particular, time and time again. Last year, the Republicans in Congress tried to jam through a disastrous bill that would lead to more than 20 million Americans losing health care raise premiums, reduce essential benefits such as protections for pre-existing conditions, maternity care, ER visits, substance abuse, mental health, and more. After the Republicans failed, the administration turned to death by a thousand cuts, instilling uncertainty in the market and attempting to sabotage the ACA behind closed doors. The President seems to think health care is a game. He is toying with the lives of Americans. This was made clear by his baseless decision to cancel cost-sharing subsidies, which increases costs to the government and has led to double-digit premium increases in many states. This is unacceptable. And I want to make the point, none of us think that bill or any bill that we pass is perfect. We're always ready to work together to improve it. But to make the kind of changes that clearly damages health care in this country, in my judgment, is unacceptable. I'm also troubled by the administration's resistance to adequately fund our health infrastructure at CDC, and in particular, its apparent disrespect of the NIH. Investments in the NIH should be a national priority. I want to make clear there's always been bipartisan support. This is clear, this is simple, and I know that we're going to continue to support the NIH because we all respect the essential work they're doing. But the FY18 Trump budget, as well as the planned FY19 NIH budget prior to the addendum, show that the Trump administration does not think, obviously, that biomedical research is a priority worthy of increased funding. Too many Americans are suffering from debilitating cancers and diseases. Cuts to the NIH or even level funding is not an option. And I know that there are strong views on this issue from our chairman, our ranking member, and the members of this committee. It is imperative that the government have the best research at its fingertips. We count on researchers to look at evidence to shed light on what we can do to safeguard Americans from harm. This should include encouraging the CDC to study ways to reduce injury and death from firearms. I'm glad we appear to agree on this important issue and look forward to discussing this further during my questions. Lastly, I am very concerned by the proposal to move the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health 
from the CDC to the NIH and to remove the World Trade Center Health Program from NIOSH's assistance and management. Not only could this jeopardize the level of care provided to more than 83,000 9-11 first responders who have received monitoring and treatment from the World Trade Center Health Program under the existing structure, it would create fear and uncertainty for those who have already sacrificed greatly for our country. I implore you to stop this proposal. So in conclusion, as you know from the chairman, this is a very important committee to me and to everyone who serves on this committee. And I know that we all look forward to working with you. Thank you again for assuming this responsibility. Thank the gentlelady and Mr. Secretary. We uh, again appreciate you being here. And I'll recognize for whatever opening statement you care to make. Well, uh, thank you very much, Chairman Cole and Ranking Member DeLauro and Ranking Member Lowy and uh, uh, Chairman Freelingheisen. Uh, thank you for inviting me to discuss the President's budget for the Department of Health and Human Services for fiscal year 2019. It's an honor to be here, and it is certainly an honor to serve as Secretary of HHS. Uh, our mission is to enhance and protect the health and well-being of all Americans. This is a vital one, and the President's budget clearly recognizes that. The budget makes significant strategic investments in HHS's work, boosting discretionary spending at the Department by 11 percent in FY 2019, <laughs> $95.4 billion. Among other targeted investments, that is an increase of $747 million for the National Institutes of Health, a $473 million increase for the Food and Drug Administration, and a $157 million increase for emergency preparedness. The President's budget especially supports four particular priorities that I've laid out for the Department at the direction of the President, issues that the men and women of HHS are hard at work on already, fighting the opioid crisis, increasing the affordability and accessibility of health insurance, tackling the high price of prescription drugs, and transforming our health care system to a value-based one. In addition, it strongly supports the ongoing work that HHS does to keep Americans safe from natural disasters and infectious threats. First, the President's budget brings a new level of commitment to fighting the crisis of opioid addiction and overdose that is stealing more than a hundred American lives from us every day. Under President Trump, HHS has already dispersed unprecedented resources to support access to addiction treatment. The budget would take this investment to $10 billion in a joint allocation to address the opioid epidemic and serious mental illness. Within that allocation, the budget doubles the amount of the state targeted response grants to $1 billion a year. It invests $74 million to increase targeted access to life-saving overdose reversing drugs. $150 million in grants specifically to confront the crisis in high-risk rural communities and $20 million to expand grant programs for pregnant and postpartum women struggling with addiction. Recognizing that we need new tools and private sector innovation to defeat this epidemic, the budget invests $500 million to launch an NIH public-private partnership to develop new addiction treatments and non-addictive approaches to pain management. Beyond the $10 billion joint allocation, the budget also increases support for programs that have a proven record of improving the lives of Americans who suffer from serious mental illness. Second, we're committed to bringing down the skyrocketing cost of health insurance, especially in the individual market. The budget proposes a historic transfer of resources and authority from the federal government back to the states, empowering those who are closest to the people and can best determine their needs while also bringing balance to the Medicaid program. Third, prescri prescription drug costs in our country are too high. President Trump recognizes this, I recognize this, and we're doing something about it. We propose a five-part reform plan to further improve the already successful Medicare Part D prescription drug program by straightening out incentives that too often serve middlemen more than they do our seniors. The budget also proposes Medicaid and Medicare Part B reforms to save patients money on drugs and provide strong support for FDA's efforts to spur innovation and competition in generic drug markets. We also want Medicare and Medicaid and our entire system to pay for health and outcomes rather than procedures and sickness. 
Our fourth departmental priority is to use the powers we have at HHS to drive value-based transformation throughout our health system. This budget takes steps toward that shift, laying the groundwork for the value-based care vision I recently laid out. Our system may be working for entrenched incumbents, but it isn't working for patients and the taxpayer, and that has to change. Finally, I'd like to highlight this budget's investment in HHS's efforts to keep Americans safe from a range of threats, from natural disasters to international infectious threats like Ebola and pandemic influenza. The budget funds the continuation of successful public-private partnerships such as the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, which has launched 34 FDA-approved products since its establishment in 2006. The budget also provides U.S. support for the Global Health Security Agenda, an effort to build other countries' response capacity so we can avoid infectious threats from ever reaching our shores. The President's budget will make the programs we run really work for the people they are meant to serve, including by ha making health care more affordable for all Americans. It will make sure that our programs are on a sound fiscal footing that will allow them to serve future generations, too. And it will make the investments we need to keep Americans safe. Delivering on these goals, as the President's budget does, is a sound vision for the Department of Health and Human Services, and I'm proud to support it. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the Committee's questions this morning. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. That's pretty impressive. You were in two seconds of the five minutes, so well, you do better than our members do up here. Uh, I want to actually begin uh, the questioning where you left off, uh, because I, and I want to tell you, having dealt with the first budget, I actually do think this is a much better budget than we saw last year. And uh, I want to commend you that, particularly NIH, last year we saw a lot of cuts, as you pointed out appropriately. We've got an increase in funding here. We may want to go further than than you proposed, but I just, I, I really want to thank you for that. I want to thank you, too, for last year's budget. Uh, we had the so-called uh, FNA issue, Facilities Administration. That's not in this budget, and I really want to uh, uh, commend you on that. I think it's important to, in uh, securing our biomedical research base that, that we not walk down that road. Uh, what I want to ask you specifically is, uh, can you describe how you intend to maintain and enhance our preparedness within the top line funding level. I think that's probably the number one issue for this committee. We all know we could have another Zika, Ebola, uh, you know, a pandemic event of some sort, and goodness, we could always have a, you know, hope this never happens, but a bioterrorism event. So tell us what you're planning to do there. Second related question to that. Uh, a couple years ago on this subcommittee we proposed, and the Senate was not too interested in it, uh, to actually have uh, an immediate response fund for disease outbreak, something like we've you know, proposed in the past. So I'd like to get your thoughts on whether or not you would find that a useful tool at your disposal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you have touched on an area of great personal passion for me, having been at HHS on 9-11 there for anthrax, preparedness for potential smallpox outbreaks, SARS, monkeypox, um, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, so I have been deeply involved in that in my past life at HHS, built and assisted in building many of the key structures that we're now talking about funding. Um, so a deep passion and commitment there. We are providing in the budget $2.8 billion, or an increase of $157 million, for priority biodefense and emergency preparedness programs. Um, these will address natural disasters, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, cyber threats, and infectious disease outbreaks. Um, the majority of the increase is targeted towards pandemic influenza threats, as you and I spoke about in your office, um, an area that I think we need to continue to just keep our, our foot on the pedal on. Um, this, No matter what current press or activity, that has got to always be a core element of what we're doing is pandemic preparedness. Of that 2.8, 2.2 is included for the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response. Another 660 is at CDC in the Public Health Emergency Preparedness Grants. Um, I do, the last question that you asked was around the, um, the Federal Emergency Response Fund. Actually, we do support that. Um, we do think having a flexible pool of money that enables us to be agile and nimble. We can't predict these threats. We do our best. We have programs against many of them, but we don't know what the next Zika or Ebola will be. Well, that's uh, that's something we look forward to working with you on, and perhaps you can help us convince our good friends in the uh, in the other chamber uh, that this is a wise idea. I know my uh, my good friend, the ranking member, supports it. I'm going to move quickly to another area I mentioned, and it's not directly the uh, responsibility of this subcommittee, but I have a particular passion uh, for Native American issues, and uh, you have 
supervision, obviously, over the Indian Health Service. We've had uh, steady bipartisan increases in funding there. I'm actually pretty proud of that. Uh, but we all know the shortfalls are great in that particular area. Uh, and uh, you, there are a number of Native American health initiatives that actually are under the jurisdiction of this uh, subcommittee. So I'm curious what your plans are there, how you see the situation, and where you would like to, to move ahead. So we, t we take our stewardship of care for uh, the Native American and, um, and Alaskan Eskimo community through the Indian Health Service very seriously. Um, I have always been deeply involved in those issues at HHS personally, uh, and I'm very proud that our 19 budget proposal uh, proposes $5.4 billion in total discretionary funding for IHS, which is an 8% increase over the FY18 CR. Um, so we, we do intend to make a significant investment in this space. We've also been working with the committees of jurisdiction in the FY18 um, uh, omnibus appropriation to see what we can do there to further support our IHS efforts. Um, we're focused on performance improvement across the IHS. We've dedicated in this proposal $58 billion, which I think is a $29 um, million increase to get to $58 million to focus on the certification issues that are particularly plaguing uh, some of the Great Plains facilities. I'm, I'm delighted that CMS has been able to work with the Pine Ridge facility to clear their immediate jeopardy finding. Uh, they're now, of course, going to be in needing to get a renewal there and pass the following certification. Um, we have a comprehensive quality framework agenda for the IHS. We want to improve quality of care, service delivery, customer service. Um, I've asked the Deputy Secretary to personally take this charge on working with the IHS. I'll be deeply involved there, um, but we also hope that the money that we've requested puts our money where our mouth is on that. Well, I, I thank you very much for that, and I can assure you you'll get very strong bipartisan support for that initiative. With that, I want to go to my good friend, uh, the Ranking Member from Connecticut. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and just on the point of a public health emergency fund, with the, which the, the Chairman referenced, uh, I reintroduced the bill again this year. It's a $5 billion uh, fund uh, patterned after what we do in disaster relief so that we do not have to go through the normal uh, appropriations process, but at the discretion of the Secretary, uh, when we have a public health emergency like we do with opioids, like we... Uh, 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 like we did with Ebola or Zika, et cetera, that we can move more quickly than we've been able to in the past. So I will get you a copy of that legislation and hope you might be able to endorse it. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, let me begin by asking some questions about this is where I, uh, where I left off. And this is about um, the employee at HHS um, and who's continued to make uh, uh, the news uh, due to what has been regarded, and not my view, but illegal actions, uh, uh, and this is based on court decisions. This is the Jane Doe decision. Uh, I want to talk about Scott Loy, director of HHS Office of Refugee Resettlement. Job description, director, and the Homeland Security Act, responsible coordinating and implementing the care and placement of unaccompanied alien children in federal custody, ensuring that the interests of the children are considered in making decisions about their care and custody, responsible for identifying shelters, other facilities to house children who have entered the U.S. and for ensuring that the shelters remain suitable. Is responsible for overseeing the placement process, includes identifying sponsors in the U.S. who can care uh, for the uh, uh, unaccompanied uh, 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 minors. The vast majority are family members placing children with those sponsors. The director is responsible for compiling and publishing a list of individuals who can provide guardian and attorney representation services uh, for UACs. As I said in my opening remarks, Scott Lloyd is not a doctor. A uh, lawyer, I have high regard for lawyers, but he's not a medical doctor. Uh, and in my view, he has shown disregard for the Constitution, overstepped uh, the boundaries. He has abused his authority, forced his own personal beliefs on immigrant women in his custody over and over again, violated their constitutional rights. Um, he has put their lives in danger considering subjecting a woman to unproven medical experiments. He has personally tried to block a rape victim from getting an abortion. He wrote in a government memo, and I quote, here there is no medical reason for abortion. It will not undo or erase the memory of the violence committed against her, and it may further traumatize her. I conclude it is not in her interest. Not a medical professional. Uh, his actions have been overruled by a federal judge. We met on February 6th in my office. You said you needed to look into the situation. And you said, we are trying our 
the, the best we can to comply with any legal obligations that we have both under the statute constitutionally. We believe we're doing things right and correctly, but it's a very difficult task, a very difficult charge. Since my time is limited and not for, I, I want to, don't want to cut you off, but so kind of yes and no's on, on these things. Have you met with Mr. Lloyd since becoming the Secretary of HHS? Um, so I, I, ha I, have met, I have met with Mr. Lloyd, yes. Okay. Um, and what, what have you had, what, what's your nature of what, your conversation? So, so, um, so I have, following up on our discussion and, and discussion with others, I have looked into this, and I, I do want to be very clear that I, I don't believe this is an issue involving Mr. Lloyd. This is actually, it's a very serious charge that we have, as, I, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. We're, we are charged by statute with these children and to look out for their interests. Um, and there is actually a longstanding policy dating back to 2008 for the serious, for providing serious me medical services to these children, including involving di discussing parent with their parents if we can reach them, parental notification and input um, as, as, as appropriate complying with state law. It's a very serious charge. This is not about Mr. Lloyd. This is a well, long-standing policy. How we deal with this well, very right. difficult issue of serious medical care for these children. Mm -hmm. But it, it's um, uh, the the in 1997, the federal settlement in Flores versus Reno requires the ORR to provide emergency health care and family planning services. This is in 1997. This is with regard most recently. Um, uh, you had a, a Texas state judge who ruled that Jane Doe was mature enough to make her own medical decisions. So the questions are, are you um, concerned that Mr. Lloyd is violating the 1997 federal settlement? He is violating constitutional rights of these young women? Is it appropriate for a political employee appointee to override the determination of, of a, a Texas state judge? Um, and do you think it's appropriate for policies by HHS or any office within to take precedence over the law and the U.S. Constitution? So, so we will absolutely comply with the law and the Constitution as, as determined by the courts. But also part of the law is complying with that very unique statutory obligation we have to look out for the interests of these children and their unborn children. Part of that is talking to the parents to get input, complying with state law. Um, it's, it's a very difficult case-by-case -case situation, and if we get different guidance from the courts on how we need to be implementing that, we certainly will do that. Well, the courts so far have ruled in favor of these young immigrant uh, women, and uh, the, um, it would appear that Mr. Lloyd uh, is, um, uh, would need to hold him to the law and so that he should not be interfering with what is the constitutional right of access to health care. That is there. And we know that we have, whether you like it or not ideologically, there is a law that says they have a right uh, to health services uh, and to legal and safe uh, abortions. My final okay. question, Mr. Mr. Chairman, is that, look, I, I, I shouldn't really have to ask this. This is a gentleman who, who should be gone from this position. He is not a medical doctor. He is not a psychiatrist. And reaching these children's families is often lengthy, and it's a process that puts their lives in danger. I'm just going to ask you flat out, Mr. Secretary, when will you fire Mr. Lloyd? This is simply not an issue of Mr. Lloyd. This is the statutory obligation of the director of the Office of Refugee Resettlement to coordinate and implement the care and placement of these minors, including providing for serious medical service to them and following the... So you're not going to do that, and you're going to put their, their, you're going to put their, their, uh, their health in jeopardy. Has gone well beyond. Well beyond. I, I so I want to give you a chance to respond if you care to add no, anything. I, I certainly appreciate any concerns that you have, but we, I do want to make very clear this is not about Mr. Lloyd. This is the longstanding policy and procedure of the Department of Health and Human Services dating back at this least... This is about access to health care. Access to health care. Lady has serious medical service. Time. Absolutely. Okay, again, we're going to try and be generous with the clock here. We always are, but I would just ask the members to stay within the five minutes if they possibly can, because I will intervene. Uh, with that, we go to my good friend from Maryland, Mr. Harris, for any questions he might care to ask. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and uh, Secretary Azar, it's a pleasure to welcome you here, someone who grew up in the beautiful first district of Maryland, uh, and I know a lot of your family still resides there. 
Let me just follow up on, and I, I appreciate uh, your response to the uh, ranking member about the ORR, because it's in, a, it's in an interesting circumstance. This is not about access to health care. It's about access to abortion. Let's just say, let's use the A word. It's access to abortion. And as you realize, not all countries in the world actually have legalized abortion. In fact, in many countries in Africa that, where it's absolutely illegal, where it's against the cultural uh, preference of, the, uh, of those countries. So that I would hope that if we get refugees from those countries, that we don't impose our, uh, uh, our constitutional framework or legal framework upon refugees from countries where, where it may be illegal in those countries, because then what we'd be doing is we'd be just making this a place to come. If you want an abortion, and, and in your country it's illegal, and I, you know, countries around the world have the right to restrict abortion, they certainly do. I wish this country restricted it more. Uh, you're in a difficult situation, so I applaud actually uh, using flexibility, saying, look, uh, you know, coming, a non-citizen coming to the United States actually doesn't have a constitutional right to abortion. Uh, and uh, we should respect that they could come from cultures where it is not as widespread, as accepted, as unfortunately is here. Let me get to some specific areas, and, uh, you know, I, I'll try to uh, stay within the, the five minutes, and there are many uh, areas of concern. Uh, one is about uh, the, uh, and, I, uh, and I question usually the Secretary about this every year, about uh, the debate about population-wide sodium levels and restrictions. And uh, just an area of concern, and I, I may just uh, do a, a follow-up question in writing about the review about the uh, dietary reference intake for sodium. As you know, the National Academy of Medicine has, has said we're, we're going to look at it again. HHS, I understand, is one of the primary sponsoring agencies. But just recently, you know, they put together these committees, and just recently two members of the committee actually write an uh, editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association espousing a, a, a further sodium reduction outcome. And it just looks a little strange that, that what we're doing is we're assembling a committee that's going to objectively look at what these things should be, and then two of the members of this committee actually write in probably one of the most uh, broadly distributed journal that they obviously have a, have a preformed opinion before this, uh, uh, this <laughs> committee even meets. So I have concern about that, and I may follow up with uh, that with you in, in writing. Uh, with regards to biodefense, and we, we discussed it, it's one of the areas of interest, and I know the chairman has asked you about it as well. Uh, you know, I, I, I have concern that uh, as, we, as we choose, because we, we recently had the uh, a, uh, pandemic flu that was more serious than, than before, uh, but we have to, you know, we, we include uh, protection against that with also uh, countermeasures against terrorist-related chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear uh, threats. And we have to balance, you know, where are we going to spend our resources looking forward in, uh, in, uh, in biodefense and pandemics. Um, and, and it's just an issue that, that I hope you you, the HHS spends time carefully considering how that balance has to occur, because both are threats. I mean, the flu is a threat, but, uh, you know, a, 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 as the chairman alluded to, a, uh, a, a broad uh, uh, biological threat, for instance, and, uh, shifted from its initial, uh, from initial focus on providing uh, low-cost medication or medications at lower cost uh, to needy populations, and I think the system's been gamed a little bit. Uh, of interest, and, and I hear this uh, commonly, and I hope um, uh, the CMS addresses it, as a physician who delivered medi medical services, I know that the administrative burden uh, placed on physicians is huge. In fact, I understand that uh, last night JAMAC, the Journal of the American Medical Association, actually published an article saying that our administrative burden for our, for our health care providers is about three times that in other, in other countries. And, uh, you know, administration uh, doesn't solve anyone's health, health problems, doesn't treat any patients and I think is a waste of resources. And finally, uh, I know there was, there was guidance issued uh, in October 2017 regarding the 1303, Section 1303 of the Affordable Care Act, uh, restrictions on exactly how abortion services were going to be uh, funded, the coverage for abortion services, uh, the needing for both a separate payment as well as a separate collection uh, the guidance was issued, and I guess we'll just do follow-up questions about uh, how the department is uh, dealing with following up with uh, enforcement of that guidance issued in uh, 2017, October of last year on this issue, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman, uh, my good friend, the gentlelady from New York, the ranking member of the full committee. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Um, it was about 22 years ago that I had a, a disagreement <laughs> In fact, it was a battle with Representative Jay Dickey in opposition to his amendment that placed a chilling effect on CDC research on injury and death due to firearms 
Since that time, more than 600,000 gunshot victims later, the CDC has largely avoided this research. I understand there's some going on, but not to the extent possible. Prior to his death, Congressman Dickey reversed his position, stating that he had deep regrets about the amendment and, in particular, the lives that could have been saved during this time. Mr. Secretary, I'm pleased to know that you believe CDC has an important research mission and are supportive of CDC conducting research to gather evidence to prevent firearm injury and death. I just wanted to know what you need from this subcommittee to empower CDC and its research partners to conduct even more research to reduce injuries due to firearms. Um, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Lowy. Um, as I as, as referred, was referred to by uh, Ranking Member DeLauro from our discussion, um, as we look at that Dickey Amendment, um, we that's a prohibition of advocacy, promotion of gun control. We don't believe that it gets in the way of our ability to do violence research or firearms violence research at any part of HHS, which um, I think was relatively clear. NIH, as, as you may know, NIH has ongoing and has had projects involving violence and firearms violence already provided. Um, I, after I made my public statement in that regard, I had a discussion with the acting director of CDC, Dr. Shukit. Um, where she confirmed my understanding that we don't have any statutory prohibitions, um, and so I think I think we're all I think we're clear, and um, it's really now sub always subject to the peer review process and funding priorities. But um, I think we've now made it quite publicly and within the administration clear that we don't see any barriers around uh, violence or firearm violence research. We're in the evidence and science gathering business. Thank you very much. Uh, a woman's decision on if and when to have a family and to healthfully space pregnancies is among the most important decisions of her life. Thanks to the contraceptive coverage provided in the ACA, more than 62 million women have access to birth control with no out-of-pocket costs, saving consumers more than $1 billion each year. And yet the Trump administration has issued interim final rules that would remove contraceptive coverage requirements. This is particularly concerning as Republicans complain that women could access contraception from Title X family planning centers or Medicaid, all while congressional Republicans are still to this day fighting to eliminate funding for Title X and included a devastating blow to Medicaid under their health care bill. It's almost like they just don't care about women having access to affordable birth control. Before issuing the interim rules that would gut contraceptive coverage, did the department do an analysis of the increased cost for women? Uh, I, I am not aware of any analysis that was done before the interim final rules on this conscience provision to try to really balance women getting access to the care that they need and the small group of employers who have a conscience, a moral or religious conscience objection, um, we, we try to balance that. It's a very important American interest to balance right of conscience. We also want to make sure women have access to the care that they need. As, as we've looked at that under the conscience provision, it's probably about 200 employers, fewer than 120,000 impacted people, which is actually fewer than under the Affordable Care Act's grandfathered plan provisions, vastly fewer people impacted than, than that, which doesn't even, isn't even subject to the contraception mandate. So we're trying to balance. We really are, are trying to strike a delicate balance here between very important interests on, on all sides and trying to be as sensible as we can to accommodate those. Just in conclusion, because I know I'm running out of time, I'd be interested in your evaluation of the unintended pregnancies. Has the department conducted an analysis into the likely increase of unintended pregnancies if contraceptive coverage is rolled back? I don't know if they have. I'd be if if if, if you'd permit me, I'd like to get back to you in writing on that, just because I'd like to check and make sure I have the answer to that. I I don't I'm not sh I'm not positive about that question. I appreciate if that was part of the analysis. Of course, I appreciate your response. Um, but I'm concerned that a purely political decision to make contraception more expensive for women could result in unintended consequences, and I'm glad 
that um, we have an understanding, and I'd appreciate you getting back to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank, uh, thank the ranking member. She's done better than anybody else in sticking to five minutes. So oh, thank you very much. Oh, can I have a few much. more minutes? No, no. Uh, but I appreciate your leadership, as always. Uh, so with that, I want to go to my good friend from Washington, Ms. Herrera-Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, as you know, uh, you inherited uh, the growing problem of a backlog of Medicare appeals at the administrative law judge level. Um, and this backlog presents severe hardships for small companies, many of whom just don't have the money to float, <laughs> to stay in business while they wait year upon year upon year. I mean, we're, we're talking about small businesses. Um, in 2016, the U.S. District Court for the, um, D.C. ordered Medicare to reduce the backlog of cases pending at the ALJ level by a threshold uh, reduction schedule, which would achieve a 100% reduction by 2020. Um, I guess, are you aware of the court order? Um, what are the department's plans to reduce the waiting period for these healthcare companies um, at the ALJ level, and what progress has HHS made towards reaching this court order goal? So, Congresswoman, thank, thank you very much for raising the issue of the, the appeals backlog. It, it is, as you said, a very important and, and priority issue. So we actually had, as part of the discretionary caps deal, the budget deal, um, I don't know where this will end up in the final omnibus appropriation for 2018, actually proposed a $500 million plan that we believe would clear off the backlog um, of, uh, of, of the Medicare appeals uh, cases, both at the Departmental Appeals Board and the Office of Medicare Hearing and Appeals. So uh, we, we remain hopeful that that $500 million of no year availability money might make it into that. Um, we also, in the 2019 budget, in the event that doesn't happen, we do have a plan in the 19 budget that similarly tackles this at level one, two, three, and four of the appeals processes, providing funding um, to, we think, clear off the backlog and get us on a sustainable path, um, both in terms of the procedures of appeal, but also staffing of judges, um, departmental appeals board judges, et cetera. So we think it's a comprehensive approach that ought to be able to deal with this if the Congress agrees with us and funds it. Great. Um, we'll be looking for that. Uh, next question. Um, I'm sure you, you know this. The U.S. has a, a increasingly, um, or should say, an increasing number of maternal mortality um, uh, events in our country. And I think we're the highest for the, de for the developed world, but we're the worse yet, we're increasing year over year. Um, and more startling is that it just seems like it's news to people. <laughs> I mean, every time I say it, it shocks me, and, and it, it pretty much everybody I, I present it to, it's news. Um, so the first step in my mind to reversing this trend is having robust data collection at each state level so states can understand why women are losing their lives and then what we can do to help uh, future moms. Uh, I've introduced a bipartisan bill, um, the Pre Preventing Maternal Deaths Act, that would create a dedicated program at CDC to help states create new and improve, uh, new and then improve upon it, the ones who have existing uh, maternal mortality review committees. Um, it is a very inexpensive bill. I mean, we're eking out a, the money to get this done because it, it's just, it is so critical. Um, and as we're working to get this passed in Congress, um, I wanted to see if the department would prioritize support for uh, materni uh, maternal mortality review committees. Um, so uh, we will be very happy to work with you on that legislation. We do at the CDC, we have emphasized the importance of state level um, data gathering, as you said, on maternal deaths and mortality. Um, including the, mater the maternal mortality review committees that operate at the state level, increasing the quality and quantity of the data that we get and so we can understand the causes of, of, of maternal mortality. Um, so we've made a lot of progress, we think, but, um, but certainly more can be done to assist in the collection and the dissemination of robust and accurate data around maternal mortality. Thank you. Um, my final question. Um, I wanted to mention um, that I strongly support uh, this bipartisan legislation. It's called the ACE Kids Act, and it would basically improve care, coordinated care for Medicaid's sickest kiddos. Um, right now, if you're you're limited by zip code, um, if you're on Medicaid and you're a chronically ill child, and so if you're in an area where it's it's good for you to cross the state boundary um, to get care, you know 
20, 20 minutes from home or be required to drive three hours north to you know, the in-state care facility, you, don't, you, don't, you might not have that option. Um, we're obviously not gonna build world-class facilities in every single community, right, for, ch for children, but we, what we do need to do is make sure that kids who don't live in those communities can then get there, can access it. And right now, if you have commercial insurance, you're good, if your parents can afford it, you're good, but if you're on Medicaid, the state directors can basically say no dice. You have to stay here. And I have worked with specific families on this. It is heartbreaking. Um, this bill would change it. It's bipartisan. For those who aren't on it, get on it. Um, but I wanted to put that uh, on your radar. Um, and as we move forward, seek your help in, in kind of s smoothing the way for this. It's good policy. It will save money. And more importantly, it will save lives. Well, uh, thank you. We're, we're very happy to work with you on this, in this important space. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on order of arrival, we now go to my good friend in Massachusetts, Ms. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here with us today. I want to talk about the newly formed division of conscience and religious freedom uh, within the Office of Civil Rights. I certainly agree the Office of Civil Rights should be concerned about religious discrimination, but I'm a little perplexed by uh, the focus on this one particular civil rights. And is the OCR no longer going to be in charge of policing discrimination on the basis of that religion? Will that be totally within this new office? I'm sorry. So this this would be a this is a component of the Office of Civil Rights. So it would it would remain within there. So that function would still be. If I understand the question correctly, it would yep. it's still within that. It's just a, it's an enforcement division within within OCR. So you have proposed some rather complex uh, new notice and reporting requirements for healthcare providers and federal enforcement. You've also proposed. Uh, cuts to the OCR of $8 million, approximately five staff members. How are you going to fund the enforcement of these uh, the new proposals um, with these cuts? So it's a fairly small, uh, fairly small commitment for this, for this division within the Office of Civil Rights to engage in this enforcement. You know, it's interesting. We, um, ever since we've, we've announced our, that we're open for business with, uh, to enforce these conscience and discrimination provisions, some of which I think have been on the books as much as 40 years, um, we have seen a large number of complaints being co coming in and that now actually can have the focus to be investigated in this space um, to ensure that we're protecting, protecting the rights of people, rights of providers in, from the right of conscience in this space. So it's very, but it's a relatively small. But with that influx then. and with the proposed cuts to the overall office, how are you going to balance that? Uh, that, that's, that's just about, I think it's well within the capacities of OCR to deal with our, our range of different enforcement activities from HIPAA through conscience protection in there. Um, we don't see that being any issue of our ability to manage. It's, it's still, even with the increase of complaints that we have, it's not a material kind of financial commitment within the broad scope of OCR, certainly. Mm. As of this Tuesday, uh, 24,000 public comments have been filed on your proposed regulations around conscience uh, regulations. Not one of them is available uh, for public review. Uh, as appropriators, I think we're particularly interested in looking at these comments um, for proposed rules that may have significant budgetary impact on the agency. Uh, when will you provide access to those public comments? Um, I'd be happy to get back to you on that. I don't, I don't know under the APA the position on that in terms of when we, if it's still while there's a comment period open or once it's closed or when we make those available. If, if I could, I'd like to get back to you with an answer on that just so I can check in with my general counsel on what the right procedures are there. But Sure, I'd appreciate that. Um, if you can also help me understand some of the impact uh, on my constituents of this new office and some of these new rules. Um, I have a constituent who is taking PrEP. It dramatically lowers the risk of contracting HIV, commonly used by gay men. Um, and will a doctor or pharmacist be able to deny my constituent access to that based on uh, their religious beliefs? I don't, it's hard for, I don't, I, I want to be careful speculating because it's a serious matter. I 
I would be surprised by that. I'd want to check on that, though. If again, I'd, let me get back to you on that so because I, I'd be I would be surprised that 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 is the type of conscience objection that is that that or it's really what the statute. We're not inventing new provisions. We're enforcing various of the but you could deny birth control would that is that a clear example I, I again I wanted I, I want to make sure I understand exactly the different conscience statutory provisions that we are enforcing there case by case I I it's an enforcement matter so I don't want to just off the cuff give you an answer I'd, I'll be happy to get back to you in writing on the particulars of that so this would just be case by case determine no, on people's no, like no what no it's, what guardrails? i don't want to do is case by case sitting here make something up for you i'd like it to be thoughtful this is serious enforcement matters that involve statutes i don't have the statutes in front of me and i've been on the job for seven weeks so i um, i haven't dug into every every different iteration of the conscience protections that are part of the ocr enforcement division i'm familiar with some of them certainly around the provision of abortion services, the most common one that's part of the Abortion Non-Discrimination Act for providers that don't, that have a conscience objection that they could not be retaliated against or discriminated for refusing to participate in an abortion. I, contraception, the PrEP, the, the PrEP uh, medicine, I don't know. I just, uh, I haven't looked into that yet. So I welcome the opportunity to take so a So is there anything there. beyond abortion that you're clear would fall within this new office and this enforcement? Again, I just I would want to get back to you on the parameters okay. of it. It's just, it's just an area that I have not gone as deep in yet with seven weeks on as secretary so far. I am out of time. If you would add to your response to that, um, the nature of this, this influx of um, violations that you are seeing or reports of violations that you're seeing. I would, yes, I'd clarify, not violations, but simply complaints. Complaints. Right. Thank, right. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Uh, we now good, move to my uh, good friend, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Molinar. I wanted to first follow up on uh, a question Dr. Harris had asked about the 10-year advanced appropriation for uh, the Special Reserve Fund, and um, you had mentioned the certainty that provides, and I just want to clarify, so the administration supports that 10-year advanced appropriation? Absolutely. It's, it, it's, it's really, that was part of what we did originally when we created Project BioShield in 2004, I believe, and that type of advanced appropriation gives the type of certainty that we can live up to our commitments and contracts to uh, companies that might try to be developing devices um, or biopharmaceuticals that are countermeasures for really unique government use in the event of an attack. Okay, thank you. Um, I also wanted to address an issue affecting, affecting Medicaid managed care plans. Um, as you know, the budget situation in Illinois and potentially several other states uh, presents a significant challenge for the state's Medicaid program. And, um, you know, what happens in these states can have effect on the HMOs in my home state of Michigan as well. And in fact, at one point, Illinois owed the state's Medicaid managed care plans approximately $3.5 billion. And for many plans, these plans, these debts created significant difficulties as they struggled to ensure that their beneficiaries had access to health care providers. Unfortunately, the Federal Social Security Act and its rules prevent these managed care plans from selling the debt to a third party. And our colleague, Representative Upton, has been working on a solution that would allow plans to sell this debt, um, allowing plans to access cash needed to ensure that the patients can receive uh, the needed medical services and that providers get paid. Um, I just wanted to clarify, are you aware of the situation in Illinois and the anti-assignment limitations, and also will you commit to help resolving and working and addressing this problem? So I, I am aware of that issue. Mr. Upton actually had, had raised that question um, in, our, in our discussions, as, as have you. Um, it certainly concerns me, and happy to work with you and Mr. Upton and others to see if there are solutions that are appropriate around this question. Thank you very much. Um, Last year, the administration released a set of principles for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation uh, that established more transparent procedures for developing and testing new payment models. And I agree these standards are necessary to ensure that CMMI models are first tested on a small scale, voluntary basis, and then that permanent changes can be made later. Um, 
and Congress would be very involved in that. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us what steps that you'll be taking as secretary to put these principles in place. Um, do you have plans to implement more formal regulations describing the standards and process that CMMI will adhere to? So um, we that is still under under the the potential uh, potential guardrails there are still under review. Um, I do believe I, in the speeches I gave just last week around the transition to value-based care, I firmly believe that the Centers for Medicare Medicaid Innovation, the powers that we have there, are actually vital to our ability to, to use Medicare as the largest payer in the United States and in every geographic area as a key tool to drive the value-based transformation of our health care system. I also believe that guardrails to ensure transparency, collaboration, um, are, are also vital. Whether those are in regulation or internal procedures, I, I, I need to determine um, on that. Um, I also do want to be clear, I think there was a statement made about only voluntary use of, CMM, of that CMMI authority. Um, where necessary to ensure an adequate statistical design and an adequate, adequate test and demonstration of procedures or alternative payment models, um, I do believe it, it may be necessary for elements to be mandatory, um, but again, through those types of guardrails of transparency and collaboration. Okay, and that would be working with Congress to implement that if it wasn't mandatory. Yep. Of course. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to the CDC for a moment. Um, CDC has over 100 different surveillance systems used to collect and analyze data related to the public's health, and recently the CDC has been developing the surveillance data platform as recommended by the CDC surveillance strategy. I'm just wondering if, if uh, given that the CDC is our leading public health surveillance agency, how do you see the CDC uh, further enhancing its ability to manage, share, analyze data? Are there additional resources that Congress needs to provide? Um, do you see a need to better integrate the CDC's health data surveillance technology? So I, I haven't spoken with Dr. Shukut about these particular issues of concern around the, the multiple disease surveillance systems that we have. Um, I certainly have been able to get the type of data that we need from, um, from a public health emergency preparedness disease surveillance perspective. So I've not seen challenges with the integration or, or interoperability of that data so far. I am, however, a, a huge believer in um, big data and predictive analytics applied on top of that. Um, we're in fact, moving at CMS mm -hmm. towards approaches like that under Administrator Verma. Um, so I'd like to take a follow-up. I'd like to talk to Dr. Shukit and the team at CDC to see if there are additional areas where we can improve data collection, interoperability, and actionability of the data that we get there. As you said, it's, it is the premier epidemiological institution on Earth, and the data is the key. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Sergeant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair would ask members not to pose questions just as their time runs out. <laughs> very skillful. Uh, with that, I want to. Yeah. <laughs> well, my friend, uh, Ms. Roy Ball Allard, is uh, next. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, Miss Lee has returned, so uh, you were gone. So I apologize for that, my good friend from California, Miss Lee. No, no. Let me. Uh, uh, yield my, right now to Ms. Okay, Roy we'll, we'll certainly so pick the gentlelady up. up as we come back. Okay, to, thank you. I had okay, another. With that, my good Mr. friend, my Mr. other good friend from California, Ms. Roy Ball Allen. Uh, welcome, Mr. Secretary. Um, newborn screening is one of the great public health success stories of the 20th century, but it hasn't always been as uniform for children in all communities as it is today. Uh, Congressman Simpson and I worked together for many years to promote national standards for state screening programs. Prior to enactment of the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act in 2008, only 25 states required infants to be screened for the complete panel of 29 recommended disorders. And access to information on these diseases was also very difficult to locate. As a result, children in states that did not test for certain disorders would face lifetime disability and even the risk of death because they were not diagnosed in time to receive life-saving interventions, and their families were often overwhelmed in their searches for answers and support. Today, 41 states and the District of Columbia require screening for at least 31 of the 34 core treatable conditions, and states are actively working to implement screening for three new conditions added since 2015. Additionally, parents of the 12,000 newborns diagnosed each year with these conditions 
and the professionals caring for them now have a centralized access to newborn screening information when they are faced with a diagnosis of one of these disorders. These successes were made possible by, by her, uh, HRSA's a Heritable Disorders Program, which our bill authorized in 2008 and reauthorized in 2014. Alarmingly, your FY19 budget proposes to eliminate this program. Without this extremely successful program, what is your plan, and I have a series of que three questions here, what is your plan to continue evaluating future life-saving screening tests if the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders no longer exists to make recommendations? How will your department update and distribute the RUSP recommendations to states, and will there still be grants for states to implement new conditions on their screening panels, and who will operate, update, and disseminate information from the Federal Clearinghouse of Newborn Screening Information if this program is eliminated? Uh, Congresswoman, uh, thank you. I think those are, those are important concerns, and it's sort of obviously a very important issue. Um, I, the, on the advisory committee and the dissemination of standards and screening information, I'd like to look into that more. I don't, that's, that, that's an aspect of this I do not do not know as much as I'd like to to get back to you on that, but uh, clearly an important area of newborn screening. We, you know, this is in terms of the the program um, and and not requesting funding in the budget. Um, we do believe that there is money that states could use for, uh, through the maternal and child health block grant program. Um, but this is one of those difficult budget choices that in a in a constrained environment one makes choices. Um, it's still di that doesn't make it less difficult, however. Okay, well, let me just uh, point out a, a couple of things. First of all, um, the system not only saves lives, but it also saves money for both the health care system and the taxpayer by preventing severe and permanent disabilities because infants receive treatment early. That was not happening uh, before. And um, the, the, the newborn screening, it, it isn't just a test. It is an interconnected public health system that relies on the coordinated activities of healthcare providers, laboratories, public health professionals, and parents. And federal support and funding are essential to its success. Um, so your budget, unfortunately, would set us back a decade in the progress that we have made to protect all children from unnecessary disability and death, uh, and regardless of where they live. And so I, I'm truly hoping that, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we'll be able to, uh, you know, support this program. And uh, and, and finally, uh, my question is, if if this program goes away, who is going to operate and update and disseminate the information from the Federal Clearinghouse of Newborn Screening Information? Um, so. Absolutely appreciate that kind of that feedback and input. Um, so it's it's important for me to hear that. And on the issue of the dissemination of information from the center, with if if this were to move forward, if the committee were of course to follow the budget recommendations here, um, I do not know, and I want to get back to you in writing if I could on that question of what would be what what if any from the center input would there be on dissemination of guidelines, et cetera. Does that go away also? Um, if the if the budget request were, were fulfilled, I don't know it at that level of detail. I'm afraid. Well, Mr. Chairman, I hope we'll be able to address the concerns I've raised on this program. Thank you. I, I want to remind my friend from California; she always has a powerful advocate for all of her concerns in the ranking member of this committee. I can assure you. Uh, with that, I want to go to uh, my very good friend, the distinguished uh, Chairman Emeritus of the full committee, Mr. Rogers of Kentucky. Delight to have you here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for making space at the dais uh, for me at this time, and thank you for what you're doing with this subcommittee. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome. Which to you placed me on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I sentenced you to this. <laughs> sure. Uh, welcome, Mr. Secretary. Uh, opioids. Uh, my colleagues, Mr. Cole in particular, have heard me time and again ex uh, extol the virtues of UNITE which is an organization we started in my district 13 years ago, and now it's gone national. Uh, we're holding our seventh annual summit on, on prescription drug abuse and deaths in Atlanta, 
April the uh, 2nd, and you've been invited, I would be very delighted if you could make, make it there to speak. We'll have 3,000 of the country's experts on this subject, on all aspects of it, law enforcement, treatment, education, and the like. Uh, so I, I would hope that you would come. Uh, we've made, and, it, and we emphasize, Unite emphasizes the holistic approach. You can't just arrest your way out of the problem. You can't treat your way out. You can't prevent your way out. You've got to do all three, simultaneous, non-ending, expensive, uh, complicated. We've made good progress toward that goal through CARA uh, and the 21st Century Cures Act, uh, but I'm quite concerned that the administration is focusing too heavily, almost exclusively, on enforcement above all else. Uh, it's important, but it's just one leg of the stool. Uh, I think we all agree. The president has expressed concern about the epidemic, uh, formed a commission, and through your predecessor declared a public health emergency, yet ONDCP, the drug czar's office in the White House, remains understaffed almost unstaffed, and the public message seems solely focused on drug cartels rather than the Americans who fall victim to these addictive drugs. In fact, just 46 seconds of the State of the Union address were dedicated to the epidemic, glancing over treatment, ignoring prevention measures altogether. Despite that enforcement-oriented rhetoric, I'm pleased to see that uh, your budget dedicates a lot of resources to the opioid epidemic. Uh, I'd like to hear how you view the administration's response to the epidemic, epidemic thus far, uh, how you intend to shape HHS's responsibilities to meet the ever-growing challenge that our constituents are facing back home. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for that, uh, for those questions around the opioids. I would say um, I, this notion of enforcement over prevention and treatment and care, um, uh, I can only tell you from everything I have seen, my interactions with the President, my work on the Opioid Summit, my work leading these efforts at HHS very directly and personally is one of the four core priorities that we have at HHS is that we are dedicated around prevention and treatment for people. How do we keep people from getting into the cycle of dependency from the legal prescription opioids? How do we keep them from transitioning then into the illegal opioids, into, into fast addiction? And then how, for those who are addicted, do we help them with treatment and keeping them for, from relapsing? I just at the National Governors Association, in fact, delivered a major statement around our full support for medic medication-assisted therapy and two um, key guidance guidance is coming out of FDA to further assist MAT. Our budget fully supports MAT, um, demanding that uh, Medicaid provide coverage of all medicines in medication-assisted therapy, a demonstration within the Part D drug program. So we're just across the board. I mean, I, we'd be happy to come up and brief you on this. I can only tell you uh, the enforcement may be an, an as a critical aspect at the Justice Department, ONDCP. Treatment, prevention, um, the, 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 13, the historic $13 billion requested uh, for HHS from 18 on is really focused around prevention, treatment, prevention of relapse, and next generation therapies and pathways around pain management. You're a, you're a former pharmaceutical executive. Um, how do you see the industry uh, playing uh, a, a positive role going forward? Uh, rather than the driver of the epidemic, as certain companies have been in the past. I've, been, I've made no bones about naming names. Uh, Purdue, Pharma, uh, uh, Purdue uh, uh, Pharmaceuticals, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Purdue Pharma, Purdue Pharma, uh, the maker of OxyContin, uh, convicted. $600 million in fines for misleading doctors about the uh, about OxyContin being addictive or not. But what can the industry do to help with this problem? I noticed that they, Purdue Pharma, now has uh, uh, fired or laid off half their sales staff, but there's been billions of these pills produced by these companies. What can, what can we 
expect? So first, I would say in terms of uh, retrospective, and I don't want to uh, be involved in mentioning individual companies' names, but the Attorney General, as you know, the Justice Department on behalf of the United States has filed a statement of interest in the state Attorney General actions that have been going on and has formed a task force looking into uh, government action here to ensure that ethical practices, whether, whether and in fact ethical ha practices have been maintained, we will absolutely ensure that they are on a going forward basis also. In terms of those actors who will, are willing to work with us in an ethical and constructive way, this is where the public-private partnership at NIH that we've requested funding for is so critical. We've asked for $500 million there to support efforts to develop that next non-opioid generation of potential pain therapies, um, and as well as another $350 million of effort at NIH to research just alternative pathways, different ways to treat pain, perhaps non-pharmaceutical ways of treating pain. And so we would look forward to any entities to work with us in a constructive ethical manner in that public-private partnership to come up, what are, what are the targets? So what are the molecular and physiological targets that we should be designing molecules against? How do we design them? And how do we, at FDA speed, the approval pathways for them so we can get more products on the market to help people so we don't get them possibly trapped in this legal opioid pathway for pain? Well, I thank you, Mr. Secretary, for focusing on, on this problem. It is of major importance, of course, to this country. Mr. Secretary, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I can chastise Mr. Molinar for asking a question at the last minute, but I'm not going to chastise the guy that put me in the chair. So uh, <laughs> I want to next go to my good friend from uh, California, Ms. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here. Uh, first of all, let me um, just uh, mention this to the committee, actually, and to yourself. I don't know if you know it or not, but we've been selected, the United States, as the site for the 2020 International AIDS Conference. It's going to be in the Bay Area, so I hope we have the support of your agency, and I'd like to sit down and talk to you about this. Uh, there are well over 1 million people living uh, with HIV and over 37,000 new infections each year in this country. So we've made tremendous progress, but we've come very close to our goal of ending AIDS by 2030. But with these cuts now, I'm concerned that we're going to turn back the clock. First of all, I'm pleased to see that you referenced in the budget supporting uh, a national HIV AIDS strategy. That's the first time I've seen that uh, with this administration. But unfortunately, it, it almost appears an empty promise or disingenuous because you completely eliminate the Minority AIDS Initiative within the Office of Secretary and within SAMHSA. That's about $130 million in cuts. Also, you propose a $35 million cut to, the, to CDC's domestic HIV and AIDS research and a more than $23 million cut to CDC's global HIV AIDS program and a cut of $43 million to the Ryan White program. So with these uh, dramatic cuts, including programs that specifically are designed to serve low-income people and people of color, how do you intend to implement the national HIV AIDS strategy and achieve our goals of reducing new infections increasing access to care and reducing health disparities and inequality. So that's my first question. Secondly, I'd like to ask you once again about these proposed cuts to the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. You proposed a $7 million cut to this institute and then a $2 million cut to the Office of Minority Health. So. I don't know if you understand what this, these cuts are going to do to uh, communities of color and people of color, because we have huge disparities in health care. And um, in our minority communities, we rely on these institutes to help us begin to close these disparities. But I'm worried now, this, especially with the signal you're sending to, to people of color, what this means. And finally, uh, if you have time to answer this, if not, you can give us an, an in writing. There were several reports uh, involving U.S. diplomats in Cuba. And so I'm wondering, is the CDC or NIH involved in the ongoing investigation into the causes of the range of symptoms reported by these diplomats? So thank you again. Uh, well, thank you very much, and uh, I, I do hope we'll have the ch we didn't have a chance before the hearing, but I hope we'll have a chance to sit down and, and talk and get to know each other. Look forward to working together in the years ahead. Um, on, the, on the Cuba issue, I do not know. I'd like to get back to you uh, 
in writing on that one in terms of what our involvement has been on the Cuba situation. Uh, so I just simply don't know there. Um, on HIV AIDS, um, it, it is absolutely a core priority for us. Um, I, was, I was actually in the Bush administration when the historic PEPFAR program, that historic landmark program was created. I was just- I must fact, know you then because we work very closely with the Bush administration on and, PEPFAR. And in fact, I, was, I just met with, um, uh, with Bill Gates yesterday on, on this critical issue and how we can ensure that we're supporting that effort um, appropriately across the globe. Um, and then with, within, within our, our budget here for 2019, um, around HIV AIDS, I would say first, the full, we, we fully support the Ryan White AIDS program, for instance, which as you know, supports, um, I, think it's, um, I think it's over three quarters of Ryan White beneficiaries or recipients of funding are racial ethnic minority groups um, members who are receiving the, that kind of care. You're um, cutting at 43 million. And well, and we're trying in a tight, in, this is in a tight budget environment. What we've tried to do is prioritize direct service delivery. So some of the programs that you mentioned around minority health were more um, um, training and infrastructure support as opposed to direct care delivery. So again, in, a, in an environment where we're trying to, trying to just hit, the, hit a cap, hit caps numbers, We've had to balance some some different items there. It's not a lack of commitment or desire around around Ryan White, HIV AIDS, or minority health. We just want to make sure, for instance, that community health centers are funded, where 62% of patients are racial ethnic minority members, for instance. So we're just trying to ensure that we're putting a direct service as much as possible out there to people. That was a theme. Yep, I understand that theme, Mr. Secretary, yeah. but you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, and you're sending a horrible sig uh, signal to people of color and communities of color in this country about who's worth supporting and who's not and who your priorities are. And to cut HIV and AIDS at this level, these programs, and to cut programs for minority health, whatever they are, sends a terrible, terrible signal to the, the people of this country in terms of who's valued and who isn't in this budget. We, we certainly would not want to be sending any signal that represents that we don't, in, we don't view on the HIV AIDS issue or minority health disparities or otherwise a deep commitment to solving and moving forward on those issues. So look forward to working with you on those, those issues in the future. Thank you very much. I now go to uh, my very good friend from Arkansas, the Vice Chairman of the Committee, Mr. Womack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Welcome aboard. I know it's uh, still early in uh, your tenure there, uh, and we expect great things out of you, and I know you'll deliver. Uh, to piggyback on my friend Mr. Rogers and his concern about uh, uh, opioids, uh, in addition to the federal government, the private sector has also recognized how devastating this crisis has been. And as an example, a company headquartered in my district, Walmart, uh, will now, free of charge, distribute these packets, Dispose RX, when they fill opi opioid prescriptions. It's a simple thing. You open the vial of an unused medic medication, you fill it with some lukewarm water, and you put this packet in it, and it hardens to where the the, the remaining uh, prescription cannot be taken. I think this is a great example of private sector innovation, and I'm looking forward to its implementation. So my question, how will you leverage such innovation to complement and further the goal of mitigating this epidemic with our federal funds? Well, thank you. I, I actually had not heard of that initiative by Walmart, and um, certainly I um, Glad to see that type of private sector initiative by our um, by our by our um, pharmacist community here. Um, as uh, Kellyanne Conway has said, and the president has said, we hope that every day will be take back day um, for drugs. So that because it is, it's such a dangerous situation. I just hope that the American people understand this. When you're given a, first, we've got to keep people from getting for a wisdom tooth or or a, a broken bone or other injury getting excessive quantities of these legal opioids. Um, there may be a role for them, but there may be roles for non-opioid pain management also. But we've got to stop this notion of uh, 30, 90 days of, pill, of opioid pills for, uh, for a wisdom tooth extraction, for instance. Um, and we're working with the states on that. That was a significant topic of discussion at the National Governors Association. But then um, for the parents out there and just for your own safety, um, if you've got those, this is not something to keep in your medicine cabinet. 
Um, it is not safe to have around the house. The temptation around these products is simply too great. The risk of diversion to children or, or others is too great. And so pr procedures like this or other forms of take, take back and destruct, appropriate destruction of these medicines is absolutely critical. Based on your uh, private sector experience, um, how, how much collaboration do you see between, say, the National Institutes of Health and the private sector to bolster the kind of efforts that we're talking about with a, a product, something like this? Um, I think probably those types of efforts will be more out of Dr. Gottlieb's work at the Food and Drug Administration as we think about the, the appropriate distribution and prescribing of these, again, very, very serious medicines. And I, Dr. Gottlieb has, has his full engagement, and he's working through a range of continued options here of how can we support states and the pharmacy community to ensure that we do not have excessive quantities of these medicines getting prescribed or even being out in the channel. So diversion into the, into the population is always a, a consideration, uh, sadly so. But uh, too, much of, too much of these uh, opioids are finding their way out from a legally prescri prescribed uh, condition uh, diverted into uh, something with more nefarious uh, type consequences. So uh, we think that it's wise for us to explore ways to make more of these kinds of things happen so that we can give people an opportunity to do something that's very convenient uh, and very practical to help us help them do their part to uh, save us from this crisis. I know I've got a little bit of time left and my, my questions remaining are, are not sufficient, so I'm going to yield my time to Molinar for taking more question, more time than, than he needed. <laughs> okay. And I yield back. He's off the bad list, thanks to you. Uh, with that, we'll go to my very good and patient friend from Wisconsin, uh, Mr. Pocan. Yep. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Secretary, for being here. Um, you just recently got an invitation from the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which is the largest values-based caucus within the Democratic Caucus, uh, to, to come and talk to us about um, the extremely you know, high cost of prescription drugs. We'd love you to take a look at that, and if you could sit down with us, that'd be great. Um, I, I think one of the biggest threats we have to affordable uh, health care is the rising cost of prescription drugs, and while there's been some bold language by the administration, I would argue some of the positions have been rather timid uh, compared to some other ideas that are out there. I'd just like to ask you a little bit about some of those. Um, the first one, I know you've been in the job for seven weeks, but you've been in the industry for a while, so I think you might be able to answer all of these, and I'd like to go through a few of them in the time, so if we can be really concise, I'd appreciate it, uh, but is the ability to negotiate uh, through Medicare for lower prescription drug costs. The AARP has said that uh, on average, uh, in the last seven years, seniors saw the price of drugs double each year, and that um, CPC, uh, we have come up with an estimate that about $429 billion could be saved over 10 years if we did just this. So this is a, a bigger, bolder idea with great public support. Uh, do you support that? There's a way we can get that done. So we, we do support getting value for medicines through our Medicare programs. Um, in Part D, we actually do, as you know, have the prescription pharmacy benefit managers that negotiate on our behalf and get the best net deals of any one in the commercial sector for our Part D beneficiaries. The challenge we have there is the out-of-pocket, and that's why in our budget, as I was mentioned in our great call, is a comprehensive five-point plan on Part D to drive down the out-of-pocket costs for our seniors. We think we'll save them over 10 years, tens of billions of dollars out-of-pocket there. Where we're not negotiating is Part B, and that's those physician-administered drugs, often very quite high cost. We just pay the bill. We get a bill, we pay 106% of the, of the average sales price. The budget proposes to allow me, as secretary, to move drugs from Part B into Part D where we do negotiate. Um, so I'd love to work with you and, and others around elements of the President's budget here that we think actually are quite bold and we'll get at that issue of what's the patient paying out of pocket at pharmacy. Yeah, and we would and argue instead of tens of billions to savings, if we can save 400 plus billion over 10 years, let's move all of them into there, right? Let's just start negotiating for all drugs and that would be a great approach. So I'd be glad to work with you on that. Also during your confirmation hearing, you said um, one of the things that you talked about was the rising cost of prescription drugs, specifically how drug companies set the list prices for drugs. And uh, I guess I had a question about that is, you know, if we're really gonna reduce the cost of prescription drugs, uh, can we address the issue? Can we say limit it to inflation? What can we really do around this because this is a huge driver of costs? Um, so 
this is the one of the most difficult issues around drug pricing is I think there are many approaches, including some we just talked about um, that the administration has in its budget to help with where we, we in many areas, Part D, we get the best pricing net by negotiating. Part B, we're not doing that. Um, so there's some proposals that we have to do to do all of that. The list price, which of course drives the whole system, right. it's a harder nut to crack, frankly. What we have in the budget is on Part B, we actually propose an inflation penalty where if a company increases the price of a physician-administered drug above medical inflation, that would actually come out of the reimbursement levels. We continue to look at a host of other ideas that can, how do we reverse the incentives for list price increases? Right now, every incentive in the system for every player in the system except the patient and us as taxpayers is for higher and higher list prices. The best way is how do you reverse those economic incentives? Yeah, yeah and I just encourage more boldness. You know, um, th there's a bumper sticker I used to have. I'm going to put back on my car again, which is when the people lead, eventually the leaders will follow. The people are way ahead of where we're at, and they think that you know we're in the pockets of prescription drug companies because we're not willing to stand up. There's been some bold language. Let's put bold policies behind that, and I think another one would be looking at how they set those prices. A third question would be, um, how about the pay for delay tactics that some brand name uh, manufacturing companies are using to delay cheaper generic drugs? You've done some other provisions around getting generics into the market. How about this one? Yeah, so um, so we're very concerned. I, I, I am adamantly concerned about any types of gamesmanship. There is a deal under Hatch-Waxman that says there is a time, there should be a time certain when your drug is off patent, and at that point, generic competition, Katie bar the door, prices fall, free competition, and efforts to delay that inappropriately are improper. We, through the budget, actually have a, a one of the pay for delay proposals we have in our budget would prevent the squatting by a generic company on that 180 days of exclusivity that they get being the first to file generic drug. If you squat on it for whatever reason, um, and a second drug can be approved by FDA, that clock will start under our proposal. That will save the Medicare budget $1.8 billion a year just for making that one change against gamesmanship. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Final word is bold. Let's be bolder in this area. Thank you. Mr. Gold. Thank you, gentlemen. And now good to uh, my very good friend, distinguished uh, lady from Alabama, Ms. Roby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary. Thank you so much for being here today. I just want to first say thank you for the time that you have uh, made yourself available so that we could talk beyond these short five minutes that we have. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that. And uh, the phone call that we had where I laid out uh, a number of, of my concerns. But the one that I want to focus on today is the department's FY19 budget request, which reiterates the administration's commitment to expanding choices, increasing access, and lowering the cost of health care. Uh, in our country. And I, I share this commitment and I support uh, reforming our health care system to give Americans m much needed relief from Obamacare. Um, when it comes to the issue of access, as you and I have discussed, I'm really concerned uh, with the fact that hospitals located in um, rural areas of our country have been closing their doors at alarming rates um, and much more frequently than urban facilities. Um, leading to less choices and less access uh, for many people who live in rural communities. And since 2005, more than 120 uh, rural hospitals have gone out of business. In my home state of Alabama, we've seen five rural hospitals uh, close their doors over the past eight years. Um, so the impact of these closures is clearly detrimental to patients who uh, will often be forced to um, travel more than 30 miles to have access to care, including elderly patients and those with chronic uh, health conditions. Um, so Mr. Secretary, um, these closures have not gone unnoticed. Rural hospitals, as you know, provide essential uh, health care services and, and in, in a lot of instances are the only health care available in communities many that I represent in Alabama's second congressional district. Um, so I would like to know how we can work with HHS and, and what does HHS intend to do to address these rural hospital closures um, and any plans that you may have to work on this important issue of access um, to care in our rural areas of our country. And then additionally, 
um, CMS pursuing any rulemaking uh, opportunities and actions to address uh, these uh, challenges um, to provide them with regulatory relief. Well, um, first, thank you for your advocacy for rural access to care in Alabama. Um, and this is an issue that is on our radar, and it's an issue of great concern to us. Um, just please know that. And um, we are following up on your suggestions around how do we re reduce burden for our rural providers. Um, we have a very important initiative going on within CMS that is Patients Over Paperwork, which is a historic, dramatic reduction in provider burden coming out of the Medicare and, the Medicare and Medicaid programs. Um, now, will that solve it? No, but it certainly can improve their ability to achieve a margin by pulling away any kind of unnecessary burdensome requirements that have accreted over the 50 plus years of the program. So we're working on that, and um, Administrator Verma is driving that with great success that has come and coming. The other is CMS has provided relief from the direct supervision requirements for our rural hospitals and our critical access hospitals, um, So, which is that notion that the, there has to be direct supervision of a doctor over others to be able to provide service and be able to bill. We're pro we've provided relief there um, for, for, for years 18 and 19. And then, of course, the, um, the, the big issue is the, the wage index, as it always is. Um, as you know, there was a report from the Secretary in April of 2012 about the wage index. Um, we, we will always look forward to working with Congress to see if there are statutory solutions. It's a matter of, from a regulatory perspective, it becomes a question, a very naughty question, because it's uh, always um, uh, a zero-sum game. One hospital wins, one hospital loses under the wage index nationwide. Um, and that's why we believe Congress has to be intimately involved in this with us working working with you, providing advice on how to steer through that. Well, Alabama is certainly not winning right. under the current law, <laughs> so we would very much appreciate um, a thorough look at that. There have been several pieces of legislation introduced uh, directly related to the wage index, and we'd be happy. But I really, uh, in, in my last few seconds, I just would love to have your commitment to continue to work with us on this very important issue. We've got to think outside of the box on some of these things, and uh, of course, I'm ready and willing to do so, and um, I appreciate your candor and your time today, and uh, again, look forward to working with you. Uh, thank you. It's, it, it, is, it is a very important issue, and we commit to work, working together on this. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, just to advise the committee, uh, the secretary has to leave at noon, so we're going to proceed. I want to give the ranking member a full five minutes to ask whatever question she cares. I'm going to give Mr. Harris my time. As you've been patient to be here this long, I know you must have a question you want to ask, and, uh, uh, so, and then uh, the ranking uh, member and I will make a brief comment to close out. So, uh, again, thank you for your forbearance. The uh, gentlelady from Connecticut is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary. Just a couple of points. You uh, noted correctly that the NIH has funded gun violence prevention research in recent years. Let me just clarify for a second. The NIH announced last year that it would not be issuing a new funding opportunity for gun violence prevention research. I would just ask you to strongly urge the NIH to issue a new funding opportunity in fiscal 2008. I have another a quick question, which is this has to do uh, with uh, the LIHE program. And uh, just a yes or no. Uh, 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 answer. Do you support the President's proposal to eliminate LIHEAP? Um, I do support the I do support the request in a very tough okay. budget environment to meet okay. CAPS. It's, okay. th these are difficult choices. Well, on, on, then on the uh, uh, Community Services Block Grant, um, where you do also propose a ter termination, uh, that also includes the network of community action agencies. I just want to request that uh, I don't know whether you've talked to local officials or, or mayors, but I would love to, uh, re really I would like to request an evaluation of uh, if this funding is eliminated, what is then going to be the effect on local governments and what is going to be the effect on the community action agencies, which as you know, provide housing, education, nutrition, and employment services. What happens with, uh, with all of that? So if you can get us a report, um, that would be that would be terrific. Um, let me just get to uh, uh, the issue of um, 
uh, Idaho and the short-term plans. I think you, you know that the Idaho officials are claiming that their state-based plan offers better coverage than would be available under your short-term your short-term uh, proposed rule. Uh, the other piece on on Idaho is that, um, uh, in in fact, I think you, uh, the administration has said that Idaho that their plan would be out of compliance with uh, with the uh, w w with the law. The short-term plans. Um, um, they're allowed to deny people insurance based on medical history, uh, charge higher premiums because of pre-existing conditions, provide skimpy benefit packages. Uh, also, let me just a couple questions with regard to this. Idaho makes maternity coverage optional. Do you believe that plan should not cover maternity care? So I want to be very clear with Idaho. Um, we, have, we have sent a letter to yeah. Idaho saying that the guidance that they have given mm -hmm would put them out of compliance under our reading mm -hmm. with their requirements mm -hmm. as under the Affordable Care Act. And if they were to continue in that approach that we at HHS would have to assume those authorities and that the plan that was mentioned there would not Sh be compliant. Should they cover maternity care? They um, make it optional. Should uh, they so, cover maternity so care? So that is a requirement under the Affordable Care right. Act. Okay. Contraceptive services, newborn care, habilitative services, which are particularly important to children with autism. Should they cover those uh, 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 efforts as well? Do these plans uh, again, cover Again, we are, we are charged with enforcing the laws as written, and the Affordable Care Act so provides, and we will enforce as long as that remains the law of the land. You probably have, have seen this, but their, their questionnaire um, uh, you know, have you or any family member listed on this application ever seen a doctor, been diagnosed, etc.? Then they list a whole variety of, of, of um, uh, health coverage um, because of these conditions, diseases, uh, uh, etc. My, my concern with this document is that checking off whether or not you've had cancer or tumors, brain, nervous system, urinary or, or kidney, um, uh, again, and, and I, you may have answered this already, but are we going to allow this uh, kind of a survey, which then would be people at risk for not getting the insurance coverage they need? And that would be including, they ask about pregnancy, congenital conditions, et cetera. What is going to be, uh, if they are out of compliance, does that mean that we are going to just say they can't move forward? And what, if, in fact, will we do if they yep. d presume to Ab move forward? Absolutely. And again, I, I empathize with the situation that the governor and the commissioner in Idaho are trying to deal with, which is skyrocketing premiums, <laughs> reduced choice, reduced access. Um, and we want to do everything we can to support the governor and the people of Idaho to mm -hmm. get a access to affordable health insurance. So please, let me start from that premise that but we, we want to work to help them. But the We're not going to allow them to move forward on these issues, which will deny people health care coverage. Not if it doesn't coverage. comply with the Affordable Care Act, which is the, which is the law. And so what the way this will work is we've given them 30 days to respond to our notice. Have they responded? If, uh, no, not yet. Um, if once they once they respond, we will make a determination. If they remain out of compliance in terms of their willingness to enforce the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, then CMS will assume that responsibility to fully enforce the Affordable Care Act. And, the, and an insurer who issues a plan that is not compliant will be dealt with and enforced against appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Uh, for the final round of questions, my good friend from Maryland, Mr. Harris, Dr. Harris. Sorry. No, thank you very much. Let me follow up on, on that uh, uh, question because my understanding is that, that the short-term plans uh, were exempt from some of the requirements of the ACA. Is that correct? That's correct. In fact, the, the, the separate issue from the issue of the Idaho Insurance Commissioner's guidance saying basically you don't need to comply is our proposal for short-term limited duration plans, these transitional plans that can be available to people. And this is actually restoring an option for states and for people that was in place during the entirety of the Obama administration until October of 2016. Right. Yeah, that's that's my understanding. These short-term plans were in place uh, and and are, are actually, uh, you know, ACA includes the ACA framework so, includes yes. the ability to have short-term plans. And let me get it straight. Now, the existence of a short-term plan doesn't interfere with anyone's ability who has a medical condition to obtain insurance under an ACA plan. Absolutely. So every American is absolutely guaranteed access to a plan that is actually by statute affordable because we set in income limitations for subsidies. We have 
uh, for the uh, premium subsidies. So that's all left in place. So there's no American who is now, if an American chooses not to have one of an ACA plan, uh, they can just choose to have a short-term plan. Okay, I just want to straighten that's out. A, that's that a very important clarification that the short-term plans are a choice. It, right. None of it changes the individual market, Affordable Care Act exchange plans or requirements that are there. Right. So, so again, just to reiterate, so if you have, uh, you know, uh, if you have a condition right. uh, where someone may not insure you under a short-term plan, you always can go back to the ACA type plans. Or, or in states like Maryland, what we're going to do is we're probably going to have a uh, separate plan with a reinsurance pool. Uh, some states have high-risk pools. I mean, there are multiple methods now. In every every person in the United States has the ability to be covered if they have a medical. And condition. I would say first, um, what our proposal would do is it puts the state back in the driver's seat. So the state is the regulator. They right. they can have requirements as high or higher than the Affordable Care Act on a, on the short-term plan, right. plan options. Secondly, these plans, as I was very clear may not be right for all people. They're an option for some for whom maybe it's correct, but they should go in with their eyes wide open and know what's covered, what's not, what's there. Um, and so, for instance, an individual with pre-existing condition, um, if an affordable plan is available in, in the individual market under the Affordable Care Act, that may be the best option. The challenge is, for so many Americans, there aren't affordable plans available, even even in the exchange system, and that's what we all have to work on. That's right, especially, I imagine, for young, healthy individuals who are priced out of the market, and, and obviously we know because millions of Americans chose to pay the, pay the penalty instead of uh, to uh, get an, uh, the unaffordable ACA plans. Let me just talk, briefly mention two issues. One is we talked about work requirements in Medicaid. Look, I congratulate the department to do this. I think this is long overdue. Uh, I think that uh, that there, there should be a compact between between the federal government and someone who applies to the federal government for uh, for uh, assistance, and that is that if you're able-bodied, you, I think it's, it's good to ask someone to apply for a job, train for a job, look for a job. I don't think that's unreasonable. The vast, vast majority of Americans agree with that. I'm glad the department is, is uh, uh, talking about it. I wish other departments, including the Department of Agriculture, would start to doing it for able-bodied individuals who, are, who want uh, the uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. I think across our, across the board, I think, I think these are good public policies. Uh, to say we will help you, but you know, if you're able-bodied and, and you know you're not disabled, you're not taking care of a child at home, uh, you could, uh, you know, you, you're expected to uh, work or be trained for work or apply for work. Especially important in an environment where we have full employment. Finally, the last is, is I'm just going to express disappointment that the Democrats blocked the Right to Try bill uh, this week. Very puzzling to me. Uh, 38 states have bills like this. Uh, you know, it, it's probably only going to be a one-week delay. I know this is a, a, pr a priority of the president because he's talked to me ab about it in a, in a meeting personally. Uh, he feels strongly that uh, a person who has a terminal illness and, uh, you know, should have access to medications even before they, they've uh, passed the phase three clinical trials at the FDA. And yes, it's probably only going to delay it for a week, but God, I feel strongly for those individuals who have to wait a week uh, because, again, the minority has blocked it uh, this week on the floor. That, that's a real shame, and I hope the administration redoubles its effort to make sure that the bill passes uh, uh, next, uh, next week, and then we uh, come to agreement with the Senate and finally have a national right to try bill. And with that, I yield back to the chairman. I thank my friend for yielding back. I want to recognize the ranking member for any closing remarks she cares to make. I'll make a couple, and then we'll adjourn the hearing. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. On that last point, let me just say, my hope is is that uh, while we would say to uh, Idaho uh, that you can't do this, that whatever the administration is proposing, and you can obviously, I mean, I am opposed to these short-term efforts. I think we've had that conversation. Uh, but that the exemptions that will be made under that effort, uh, while those will be made in order and exemptions in, uh, in, this, in states uh, will not be made in order. So we'll have to take a very, very close look at um, um, uh, at this effort. I, I, I applaud you, Mr. Secretary, for the, uh, some of the initiatives that you've taken here, but if you've heard us on this side of, of, of the aisle, the level of cuts in fairly basic
programs, and we talk about LIHEAP, community services, uh, a, a block grant, uh, a health workforce uh, a training. These are, in, in my view, when you look at your overall message, which where you said, and I just, is, I'm, I'm just quoting you, is that um, uh, we want to take a look if, if the programs are effective, uh, if they are, uh, you know, ma meeting their purpose, um, and that they are cost effective. Well, we have so many of the programs that we see now are under the chopping block that, in fact, are getting cut or eliminated. And for the life of me, uh, I don't understand the criteria upon which these decisions have been made. My final comment is I go back to this, the, the gentleman that you have serving in a very, very uh, 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 key, important place. His ideological views should not be making the determination of, I don't, whether it is the children who are coming in or anyone else, he is not qualified to do that. Uh, and he should be removed from that position. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. And I, and Mr. Secretary, I want to just thank you for your testimony today. I want to thank you for the manner in which you engaged our committee, the, the openness, the thoughtfulness, uh, uh, very impressive performance. I particularly want to thank you before the hearing for reaching out to every member on both sides of the aisle uh, and engaging us, as my friend Ms. Roby uh, said, uh, openly and candidly in conversations. is very helpful to every member of this committee. Uh, and again, I just want to tell you how much I look forward to working with you. Uh, how impressed I am uh, with the manner in which uh, you started your tenure as secretary and the manner in which you've dealt and the courtesy with which you've dealt with this committee. So uh, we look forward to working together as we go forward. And with that, we're adjourned.